Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I'll fear no evil. In our last two teachings, we've looked at what we would prefer to hide our eyes from, and that's death. We've considered spiritual death as eternal separation from God. We've considered the sudden and the anticipated death of someone that we love. And in this session, we're going to explore what we are to do when it's our turn to walk the valley. That inconvenient truth is that we do our best to ignore that one day we will experience death. We do our best. In the movie Captain Hook, or just excuse me, the movie Hook, uh, the Captain Hook, he taunts Peter Pan, telling him, prepare to die. And Peter says, to die would be a great adventure. You know, the way most people live their lives, uh, such a statement is really false bravado. I mean, it's talking a good game, it's that grim determination, it's that stiff upper lip and all. But it seems most people fear death so much that we do everything possible in our culture to hide from death, even the thought of our own demise. Americans act as if death was optional. Oh, we say things like, oh, you know, I want to die in my sleep at home in my bed. But you know what? We really don't. We don't, we, we don't want to die at all. No, we, we don't want to consider death. And yet we will die. We will. Death will come for us just like it can for our loved ones, either suddenly or with some anticipation. So let's consider how to prepare for each eventuality, regardless of which happens. And, and you know, friends, it can't be stressed enough. I can't stress to you enough. When it's your turn to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you want to walk it with God. You really do. All the little annoyances of life. As one who has asked God to accept their faith, having acknowledged that death is an inevitability, believing that Jesus is the only one who can secure for you eternal life, and committing your entire life to following Jesus, to being his disciple, you can face death fearlessly. We got some great and precious promises in scripture. But the most important preparation for your appointment with death is to be a Christ follower, to be walking in the light as he is in the light, to be loving God and loving others. Acknowledge, believe, commit, and ask, and then you will be able to allow the Holy Spirit to convince you of these great and precious promises that are in scripture. And to face death fearlessly, you will need to be confident in those promises, that those promises are true. At the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus told his friend Martha in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am, he says, right now, resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. Friends, why fear death? if you will not ultimately die. To die is to be with God, and that, that's a very good thing. In distant Western history, it was considered a reward that the people that had died were the lucky ones. I want you to allow that fearful uncertainty of death to be swallowed up in faith, hope, and love, knowing that God will never leave you or forsake you. Another great prophecy promise we find in the letter that Paul wrote to the congregation in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15, 53 we read, In the resurrection scheme of things, this has got to happen. Everything perishable taken off the shelves and replaced by the imperishable. The mortal replaced by the immortal. Then the saying will come true, death swallowed up by triumphant life. Who got the last word, O oh death? O oh death, who's afraid of you now? Paul goes on, it was sin that made death so frightening. But now in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, and death are gone. The gift of our master Jesus Christ, thank God. Death does not have the final word. The mortal believer is transformed into the immortal believer. So death is a transition. 
such an expectation of hope trumps fear. When you anticipate good things about to happen, when death comes, you tend not to fear it. Now we can spend the rest of our time just reading scripture that reveal that physical death is not the end for the believer. In your notes and posted on our live stream are scripture references um, that, that are given to you to look up that will dispel the fear of death. And before you die, make sure that these scriptures are a part of your destiny. Be walking with God. We call that eternal life. And then when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. It just will be in your heart. Now there are some this worldly things to take care of before you die. There are medical and legal issues that the Bible just doesn't address. Medically have an advanced directive. An advanced directive alerts the medical professionals of the treatments that you want and the treatments that are refused. It will save your loved ones from making impossible decisions. Now there's a web address to get a California advanced directive on our Facebook page and on our website. And you can Google the same for your state if you're somewhere else this morning. Download it, read it, have that difficult conversation with loved ones, fill it out, and then get it filed. Medical directive. Legally, there are some important things to get arranged. One, make sure you have some life insurance. That your retirement savings and bank accounts are all readily available to your loved ones. You can accomplish this through a will. A will is a legal guidance regarding the care of minor children and the distribution of your assets. Now, if you don't have a will, guess who gets to decide what happens to your estate? A probate court. And that's going to cost your survivors legal fees. Lots and lots of legal fees. A better way to make sure that your estate goes where you want it is to use a living trust, which grants the power and responsibility to take care of business if and when you cannot to a person that you designate. A living trust allows assets to be transferred to your beneficiaries much easier, like those you designate to become your legal representative. So make sure you have a will, and I would go so far as to get a living trust created. Medical directive, advanced directive, a legal document that tells you, tells the courts where your assets are to go. Life insurance is always another good idea, but this has got to be done before a diagnosis is made, okay? Get right on this. Don't, don't wait. Don't, don't talk to a life insurance agent. They, they just want to sell you something, okay? They really do. And some websites, they can help you uh, to calculate how much life insurance you're going to need. But if the site wants all your personal information, don't fall for it because then those companies will just stalk you. And all of a sudden, you'll get hundreds of inquiries. Now, the general rule of thumb that I've read is that you need to get 10 times your yearly income plus 100000 per child plus paying off debt, including your mortgage. That's a lot of money. Yikes. Now, that's not my legal advice, okay? I'm not a lawyer. I can't do that. This is just coaching. You'll have to do your own work and figure out exactly what you need. And your age plays a major role in the cost of premiums. So it's good that you go shopping now and, and shop for the best deal. At least, at least have a policy to cover your end-of-life expenses, which can range somewhere between ten and $20,000 for a memorial service and a casket and a place to put your remains until the Lord comes back for us and pulls those remains up out of the earth or out of the crematorium or wherever you may have decided to place your remains. Now, with this worldly stuff taken care of, that advanced directive, the legal distribution receipt and your life insurance, we, we've taken care of some temporal matters. So now we can turn our attention to some relational ones to matters of the heart. And once again, before you die, make sure you have a right relationship with God. Make sure that your loved ones know that you're a Christ follower. And of course, that should be obvious because of the way you've lived your life, because you're a lover. <clears throat> it's best to depart this life for the next with a clear conscience. If there's an estrangement between you and somebody else, work at reconciling it. If there's someone that you need to forgive, 
then cancel their debt. If you need to ask for forgiveness, do it. Get out from under your emotional debt. Forgive. God will forgive you also. Deal with guilt issues. If there's some pain in your life, redeem it. Don't wait. Tie up the loose ends. All you have right now, all you have for sure is right now. Along the same lines, don't put off living. From her hospital bed, Connie Winterberg sent to me while she was struggling for her breath. There was so much more I wanted to do. Friends, when this life is done, it most likely will be done too soon. So live the abundant life now. Laugh and love and grab the righteous joy everywhere you can find it. Do it right now. Don't put it off. Tim McGraw sings, live like you were dying. Live your life to the full as living like you're dying. The song that Tim receives one of those dreaded diagnoses. So what does he do? He goes skydiving and Rocky Mountain climbing. Rides a mechanical bull named Fu Manchu. And he loves deeper and he speaks sweeter and he gives forgiveness that he was denying. He chose to be a better husband and a better friend and made some time to do things that he kept putting off like going fishing. In the song, he says he seriously read the Bible, the good book, he repented of some of the things in his past. The message of that song is don't put off living today. You think you got tomorrow, you don't. All you have is right now. The Apostle Paul writes that you do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true and noble and reputable and authentic and compelling and gracious. The best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise, not things to curse. Live that way. Live your life to the full right now. The Holy Spirit will guide you into living well. We know that death comes unexpectedly. So take care of business while you can. Those that die well have often lived well. If you've taken care of business and you're prepared for a sudden death, you'll have more time to say goodbye. And again, it needs to be reiterated, faith in those great and precious promises concerning eternal life are an incredible source of encouragement and hope that drives out fear. That faith will allow the Holy Spirit to empower you to live well while you're dying. Dying well, it involves accepting the reality of the situation. If God doesn't intervene with a miracle, you are going to die. But what happens when you die is that you'll be with the Lord most likely in a place called paradise. The thief on the cross, what Jesus said, today, because of your faith, he's basically saying, you'll be with me in paradise. So I believe that when I die, it'll be okay, that things will be even better than I could possibly have imagined. Accepting the scriptural revelation, well, you can deal with the situation. And dealing with the situation will allow you to make good choices. It will allow you to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you through this incredible last journey. Dying well involves saying goodbye. And goodbyes are always difficult. I, I found them to be gut-wrenching. Because what happened is I started grieving the loss coupled with the anxiety that comes with the anticipation of the loss before the loss happens. See, I, I denied the inevitability of what was going on right before my eyes. And in doing so, I robbed myself of a blessing. You see, I needed some help. Now, as the person getting ready to depart, you need to help your loved ones deal with saying goodbye. It's painful, it's bitter, and it's absolutely honest. Saying goodbye involves giving thanks and expression of appreciation for the life together that was well lived. Reminisce with joy in the memories of those shared experiences. You tell your loved ones how important they are, how they made your life worth living and sorry that they have to walk through this part with you, but also so glad 
of their bravery to be with you. There will be tears, but that's just the price of dying well. You most likely will need someone that you can confide in. You'll need to talk, you'll need to be listened to. Mitch Alborn wrote of his relationship with Maury Schwartz as Maury gradually dies. The book is called Tuesday with Maury. That's the book. In those times together, Maury shared his final lessons on living with Mitch. Maury was leaving a legacy. We need to leave legacies too. You know the stuff that we take out of the dark and bring into the light loses its scary. We don't need to hide death in the closet. We can pull it out and expose it to the light of Christ. Dying well also involves having time to let go. One thing that's very difficult to let go is your dignity and your privacy. I mean, actually needing someone Someone to take care of you? Can you imagine? Needing someone to help you with hygiene, getting dressed, preparing your meals, giving you medicine, therapies, doing your laundry. It is not easy to get used to something like that. What it is, is, is letting go of pride. And this can be hard, especially if you've been one of those people who are rather independent your whole life. You don't want to be a burden for any, any to burden anyone with your care, and you really don't want anybody to care, to care for you. But as your ability to do even the simple things decline, now is the time to let people care for you. Receive their expressions of love for you. They need to give it and you need to receive it. Dying well involves having time to encourage. We encourage people by expressing our faith in them. That they'll be able to carry on smartly without you. You have time to bestow blessings upon them. You reach out and put your hand on theirs, giving them a great gift. You may recite to them their strengths, what you see in them, what you believe about them, what you hope that they will do in the future, but especially how much you love them. Tell your kids that you're proud of them regardless of their age. Tell your daughters that they're beautiful and desirable and worth someone fighting for. Tell your sons that they're capable of conquering the world. Yeah, I know that's not very politically correct, but truth doesn't have to be politically correct. It's something that we need, all of us need to hear. A parent saying, I'm proud of you. Dying well also involves listening to your loved ones, getting things straight, dealing with issues in the past. Time is fleeting to get relationships right. So this is the time for asking for forgiveness and making things right. This can be so hard, but there's nothing easy about dying well. Dying well involves having time to write out your own epitaph. The things that you hope others will remember about you. Mike Edwards and I talked about preaching our own memorial services. Then we just sit down and videotape the message that we would want to share with everybody who'd be gathered around our memorial service. I don't know if Mike ever did that. I know I still haven't been able to bring myself to it. But wow, what a way to pass down things to those that are left to struggle through this life. You can write down the wisdom you wish to pass on. That's really good. You can write a letter to your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, expressing your hopes for them, explaining your faith to them, telling them who you are and what you believe in. Yeah. Hmm. What a trip. Here's a letter from my great-great-great-grandfather addressed to me. How would that make you feel? Dying well involves having time to tell others of your hope. The hope that you have of eternal life through Christ who saved you and will claim you and will raise you up. The bold words of your witness may be the vehicle that introduces someone to Jesus. Dying well gives you time to draw closer to God. Now the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glorious face. We used to sing that song. Dying is an invitation to trust the love of God in the face of life's greatest uncertainty. 
Walking through the valley of the shadow of death is both a lament and a hope. A lament basically is a passionate expression of grief, of sorrow, of mourning, that our journey through this life is coming to an end. That's the lament. But the hope is that at the end of the journey, we find the beginning of eternal life. And the parting will be forgotten in the reunion that is to come. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this, because of that truth, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. The key to dying well is to have lived well, to have lived wisely, to have lived your life to the full. Dying well is the culmination of a life lived for the glory of God. And having lived well, you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death without fear. Without fear. Because you expect great things to happen.